I read your piece and something that surprised me and I didn't know about it. Maharashtra has fallen out of the top 10 in terms of per capita income for the first time. This was India's industrial powerhouse. So something has obviously changed in a state like Maharashtra. We travel in Maharashtra, the distress is very visible. So look at the state rankings of India. Maharashtra at one point in time used to be the second richest state of this country. Today Maharashtra has fallen out of the top 10 and a lot of the decline has happened in the last 10 to 15 years. No state in India has seen a rise in its per capita income like Karnataka has seen in the last 10 to 15 years and no state has seen a decline as sharp as Maharashtra has seen in the last 10 to 15 years. What is happening with Maharashtra's economy? Is the current politics affecting the state's progress? Is the state really falling behind? Let's check it out in this episode. I am Swapnil Karkare, a chartered accountant and an economist, and I'm here to talk about Maharashtra's economy. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about strictly economics and that too, the industrial aspect of it. But I cannot escape the political aspects, especially given the current political situation of this state. Over the last few years, we have read some news around how industries are moving out of Maharashtra. Recently, we have heard that many IT companies are moving out of Pune. At the same time, we have been also listening that Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra's competitors, are getting a lot of investments, foreign as well as domestic. We are going to explore this along with the basics of the GDP and government finances in today's episode. Is Maharashtra progressing or declining? Is Maharashtra losing industries to Gujarat or Tamil Nadu? And are we doing enough to get them back? Can we do better? Wait for a while as I unravel this story step by step. But first things first, the most important statistics of everything, more than 90% of the viewers have not subscribed to the channel. Please subscribe to the channel. Please press the like button and then start listening to the remaining episode. Now the second important thing, some background about what's happening in the state of Maharashtra, especially the political turmoil. Let us revise who governed when. Why is it important? First, because there are elections and we should know, we should be aware of the history. Second, uh, in today's episode, after or after today's episode, many will write, okay, what what is, uh, you know, performance of pre-Modi, post-Modi, pre-BJP, post-BJP, the, what's happening in Congress and uh, NCP and like, you know, all these kinds of things, like people will ask so many questions. So for that, it is important that we should understand which uh, period is governed by which uh, kind of government. So it is important. And because I have made different graphs and charts, and I have highlighted the years in which uh, things, uh, uh, these kinds of government changes happen. So it is easier for you also to understand okay what's happening and because of whom what is happening or under whose government you know what was the progress like so let's see i will touch these aspects quickly so starting with 2014 as we might know that uh, bjp and shivsena government uh, got together and they governed for five years devendra fadnavis was the chief minister and both contested elections together as a team, like the BJP and Shiv Sena was a coalition. And similarly, even in the opposition, the things were the same. Congress and NCP contested the elections together. Now, in 2019, things changed. Before election itself, everyone contested the elections separately. The result was that the BJP and Shiv Sena government might, you know, form the government together as they have a good uh, numbers. But there was dramatical shift so what happened was that a very ideologically unrelated front was leading maharashtra so uddhav takre led shiv sena uh, and uh, they joined hands with congress and ncp uddhav takre becomes the chief minister then in 2020 covid happened it is not related to politics but it is important for the economics because economies around the world faced different challenges maharashtra was also uh, faced with different challenges, there was decline in GDP and so on and so forth. Uh, so keep that in mind when you are reading the charts. Till financial year 2022, we were recovering from COVID itself. Okay, In 2022, Shusena party was split into two parts. 
Eknath Shinde led one faction and Uddhav Thakre was at the other faction. The Eknath Shinde Shiv Sena becomes the original Shiv Sena. Then later on we come to know that Eknath Shinde himself becomes a chief minister with Devendra De Fadnavis as a deputy CM. And uh, that Shiv Sena and uh, BJP uh, has uh, governed the state together. In 2023, NCP also gets split into two parts. Uh, the one led by Ajit Pawar was later called as the original NCP and one which was uh, with Sharad Pawar was the uh, was called as NCP Sharad, pa Sharad Chandra Pawar. That was the second uh, or the part of the NCP. So the thing was that that Ajit Pawar NCP got together with the Shinde Sena and BJP. So these three parties are now currently ruling the state of Maharashtra, Chief Minister is Eknath Shinde, Ajit Pawar and Devendra Fadnavis are both joint deputy CMs. So that's what happened in Maharashtra's politics in the last few years. Everything is really sad to see and I hope that in the next five years, whoever comes to power, whichever party is coming to power, I hope that, you know, they will try to uh, govern the state without these kind of dirty politics and splitting and all those things. I think, you know, batenge to katenge or ek hai to safe hai. These kinds of slogans are, are valid for political parties own alliance parties rather than people. People are more mature and political parties or politicians are doing a lot of, you know, problematic things. So now let us get deeper into the economics data. And again, there is a disclaimer, unlike national data, uh, state level data is not easily available and easily available that too in an Excel format so that I can, you know, easily prepare charts and uh, present them before you. I have tried as much as historical data I can put, but it's not that easy. So wherever possible, I have included, you know, some past data like from 2000 or from 1990s or something like that, but not always. Uh, mostly the data is from 2020 onwards or 2012 onwards. One more thing that I would like to highlight is that except for a brief period of 2019 to 2022, we have a BJP led government from 2014 onwards. Okay. Most of the data which I will present is available from 2014 onwards itself. So that means whatever the good, bad or ugly picture you want to perceive or you want to think about, then finally everything boils down to the BJP led government. So that is one kind of disclaimer because, you know, uh, we don't have a comparable data for a larger set. That is one disclaimer because tomorrow in comment section, I would get, you know, why you have not compared the pre 2014 Congress NCP, re, uh, you know, era versus post 2014 BJP era and you are on this side or that side. No, no, that's not the case. The availability of data and the usability of the data is more challenging. And this is what I can present in a, you know, limited time. So that was the biggest challenge for me. On the similar grounds from 2019 to 2022, we had many things. There was COVID, there was recovery from COVID and there was an instable government. So, you know, everything coming together, we have a different kinds of data. Some are good, some are bad. So because of COVID, the economy was in not a good shape. So there is, I think, a little bit of leeway we have to give for the government, which was at that moment, which is the Mahabika Sakadi. Because of COVID, you know, things happened and there was like a poor performance. So that is one thing I would like to just highlight. I'm not taking side because what happens after 2022 is that it becomes a BJP and Shiv Sena, uh, Shiv Sena government. So you might feel that, okay, uh, now the economy is booming again because of the fall in, you know, GDP or any other economic indicator around 2020 to 2022, uh, the performance was poor. And then slowly as we were recovering, the government also changed. So uh, there might be that kind of shift in it. Some success is obviously credited to the government's policy, but not all because the economy itself was improving. So you have to just make sure that you are not making that mistake while analyzing, while praising or blaming a government, 
just make sure that you are clearing your mind and you know thinking about what happened around us at the same time so that's what we have to remember and therefore the problem is that if you want to analyze this and compare party wise performance it becomes a very difficult task because of all these challenges therefore if you really want to know more about maharashtra or if you really want to you know care about maharashtra it is more important and more easy to understand the state of economy if we compare maharashtra with say gujarat or tamil nadu which are other you know highly advanced industrial uh, states that kind of comparison is very much useful rather than uh, party wise you know analysis because it's muddy so let us start with the gdp numbers maharashtra's economy was riding on a horse from fy13 to fy17 compared to other states its trajectory was smoother but gujarat was already growing at a much faster rate from fy18 onwards gdp growth decelerated and this trend was common in all the three states even for india then from fy20 onwards maharashtra's economy was hit hard compared to other two states reasons probably could be stricter rules during covid or reverse migration and so on and so forth but in 2022 its recovery was also the fastest the growth rate was higher than gujarat's so looking at this i would like to say that the government did a good job in the recovery phase and i guess so did the other governments too but from the peak of fy22 the growth has been slowed down gujarat has also seen some kind of slow down but tamil nadu's growth has been stable which is commendable but what is the conclusion here's the eye popping chart if we don't include the ups and downs during the covid period we can analyze the two periods of 5 years each one from financial year 2014 to financial year 2019 and another from fy19 to fy24 we see that maharashtra is lagging behind gujarat and tamil nadu both and in both the periods we can see that growth rates are down for other states as well in the second period we also see the same trend in the per capita income data now let us see how the government is functioning we will see this from four metrics revenue receipts which is states income capital expenditure which is the expenditure on infrastructure subsidies is basically the spending on you know giving more welfare related activities like freebies or something like that and lastly fiscal deficit how much expenditure is in excess of revenue Financial year 24 data is based on budgeted estimates FY23 data is based on revised estimates and FY22 are actual figures States revenue receipts growth has been very high close to 20% average over past decade the trend has been almost similar to GDP growth post covid the revenue receipts growth has been trending down now coming to capital expenditure which is like infrastructure spending it is not consistent the growth is not consistent at all in the last two years the growth is encouraging which is a good sign coming to subsidies the range has been between 0.9% and 1.5% of state gdp in the last two years it has grown so politicians who said that you know we should not give revenues and all those people are really giving revenues that's what we can see here lastly the fiscal deficit fiscal deficit means the amount of expenditure over and above the receipts for states the fiscal deficit limit is set at 3% of gdp from fy12 to fy17 the fiscal deficit is on average 1.5% of gdp in fy18 and fy19 the deficit has dipped one good thing was that the fiscal deficit which increased during the covid period immediately dropped the next year However in FY24 the budget as estimates show that the fiscal deficit has increased and that is a bigger risk if politicians spend a lot on various subsidies or some unproductive items then we will cross 3% mark which is not sustainable even if the income starts falling the fiscal deficit will go higher and higher which will strain the treasury Recently Nitin Gadkari also cautioned that many freebies are not sustainable and that those are also impacting the funds allocated to other programs so one thing that we can learn is that currently if you see all political parties are giving 
many freebies which i feel is not a very bad and very good sign as well it's like in a very gray area but if the fiscal deficit is about 3% because of those freebies then it's a problem for the state's finances now from government finances let us move on to industries did you know that the number of factories in maharashtra has fallen yes from 2018 and 19 onwards the number has been falling a lot this is as per annual survey of industries or asi data and surprisingly look how the number in gujarat has increased of these three industrial states only maharashtra has seen such kind of fall isn't that shameful now on this topic there are already many controversies news laundry has a detailed report on the same issue let us see what it writes the title is how modi is redirecting investments from other states to gujarat now here is a disclaimer this might look like an anti modi piece but if you see arguments in it you might feel like there is something that is going wrong with the investment decisions in the country let us see what is it first the micron story micron announced that it is setting up semiconductor plant in gujarat but the sources said that it had planned earlier in tamil nadu or telangana gujarat was not in the picture because micron's india journey began with its r&d facility in hyderabad in 2019 by 2023 hyderabad seemed like a logical choice for micron's next plant the telangana government was even preparing for a major announcement at davos until reportedly under union government pressure the project suddenly shifted to gujarat as per india's semiconductor policy the government wanted to make a cluster like taiwan in gujarat and according to government official only after this main cluster is fully operational and saturated would additional facilities in the other states be considered that is what they told the same excuse was given when telangana lost kane's technology project to gujarat in 2023 over the years four major companies tata micron murugappa and kane's were housed in gujarat and now the center has started announcing semiconductor units in other states too not the ones with existing ecosystems for manufacturing but bjp ruled states like uttar pradesh and assam the article goes into the details of many projects which were hijacked by gujarat from other states for example here's a story from tamil nadu which is the largest exporter of electronics one of the officials said we have a large talent pool robust r&d systems and a thriving local market for many years the state has been cultivating mncs to invest in semiconductor manufacturing but none of this mattered when it came to big investments the modi government promised almost 80% investments 50 from central government and 30 from state government to a big company that wanted to set up business in india if the company chose to go with tamil nadu they will not get the government's money then there's another story from maharashtra vedanta foxconn semiconductor plant was shifted to gujarat and before shifting to gujarat everything was finalized with the maharashtra government the company held multiple rounds of discussion with both the previous mva government and then later with cm eknath shinde but the project was shifted to gujarat without any official explanation after that the tata airbus c295 aircraft manufacturing project which was originally planned for nagpur was shifted to vadodara so even if we assume that okay the central government wants to make semiconductor hub in gujarat why was aircraft manufacturing plant was shifted to it that's another big question similarly there was a bulk drug park and a proposed medical devices park in aurangabad that was shifted to gujarat even the concept of gift city which was originally designed for mumbai was shifted to or moved to gujarat after modi became the prime minister lastly the report says and which makes us think uh, more about this kind of behavior and therefore we must question such attitude is that uh, there is an apparent favoritism for, for gujarat and that has meant that the states like maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu and telangana which have long invested in th- building the industries are left struggling to compete when a state loses out on a major investment the impact is far beyond its balance sheet 
and that is exactly what has happened in Maharashtra. Now let us jump to exports. Maharashtra's exports are stagnated around $70 billion annually. Gujarat has seen a big jump. But here's the thing, uh, Gujarat's exports have increased uh, due to rise in petroleum exports. If you remember, after Russia-Ukraine war, a lot of oil trade was routed through India and that benefited Gujarat. Here I would say Gujarat has a natural advantage for this sector. If you see Gujarat's product-wise exports, you can see that its exports increased from FY21 largely because of petroleum exports. This is how Maharashtra's exports look like. States have expertise in one industry and has natural advantage to move up the quality of product or quality in that industry and even diversify into something that is similar. Like petroleum in Gujarat, Maharashtra has good advantage in engineering products. Tamil Nadu has advantage in electronics and textiles. So the state should be allowed to expand around that industry, either backward linkages or forward linkages. And incentivizing such industries to take such decisions that lies in the hands of government and policies and therefore politicians. For improving investments, states run investment summits every couple of years. So in Gujarat, it is called Vibrant Gujarat Summit. It was held in 2024. Before that, it was held in 2019, 2017, 2015 and 2030. It is quite consistent that way. Tamil Nadu Global Investor Meet was held in 2024 and before that it was held in 2019 and 2015. In Maharashtra, Magnetic Maharashtra Summit was last held in 2020 amidst pandemic and before that it was held in 2018. In the last four years, there was no such summit. That is also saddening. That shows the political will also in some way. Such things impact businesses, investment decisions as especially FDI decisions. But Maharashtra has been getting a lot of FDI and it ranks first in the country, despite not holding any such summit. That is a great news. But if you look closely, you will see that the FDI is saturated around $15 billion. Tamil Nadu also has seen a saturation around $2 billion. But in Gujarat, the trend is rising. So why is Maharashtra lagging behind? And at the beginning of this episode, we saw what Ruchir Sharma said. The state's economy is declining and it's not that all states have the same trajectory. So why only Maharashtra is seeing such kind of situation? This is what we have to think and this is what we have to ask in this election season. And we also need to ask why Gujarat is gaining at the expense of Maharashtra. I'm not saying trust the news laundry report or this video. Ask the government. And I cannot say that, you know, Gujarat's FDI should stop. No, I will never say that because every kind of investment, every kind of business friendly policy will benefit people in that state. Also, I cannot say that person should not have any kind of bias. It's not going to happen. We are all human beings after all. See, even if uh, someone who we know from our city has, you know, gone up the government ranks, we also expect that person to give something to the city back, right? It's not that politicians do it themselves. It's also people who ask for such kind of favors. So I don't blame that politicians should not have that kind of bias. It is okay. In a country like India, where we hardly abide by rules based policies, it is going to happen naturally. But should such decisions come at the expense of other states and that too for all the mega investment projects? That is one question we need to ask. Also, even if we keep the Gujarat factor away, or, and focus only on Maharashtra, we see that people's incomes are not rising at the same pace as in the case of other states. So personally, I feel from 2008, 2009, 2010 onwards, Maharashtra has been losing on something or the other. So in the entire scheme of things, I will blame each and every political party politician for not doing enough, for not doing enough for the industries, for the economy, for the people, for a healthy political environment and for the undivided society. Blaming politicians is common in our country, which I dislike personally. But in the case of Maharashtra, the data clearly tells us that in the last five to seven years, whatever was happening in the political system has definitely impacted the state's economy. The power hunger of every political leader or party has created this situation. I'm not against or for any political party because I believe everyone is sane and everyone is just packaging themselves differently. 
I hope whoever comes to power this time governs a proper government and see the public angst against them and ensure that the state becomes number one once again. Political initiatives to attract businesses, creating more job opportunities, better infrastructure, and also keeping in mind the environment while, you know, all these kinds of developments. This apart, keeping society together without a divisive politics and increasing people's standard of living, increasing people's income and thereby state's income should be priority for the new government. And we really don't have any problems with Gujarat's success. Healthy competition is needed and it is welcome. It is the hijacking which we should be against of because it is problematic. Are our politicians at the state and central government level mature enough to understand it? I am being more pessimistic these days. I hope and I want politicians to disprove it. Thank you.